a millennium ago, I was a resident of Davis Hall for one semester. Uh, spring of 1963 was my first semester here. I was in room 230, which I know there's a plaque. <laughs> As Father Kahn mentioned, uh, Bishop Davis was born in Noctover, which is in Kilkenny, which I looked on the map is about halfway down the M9 between Carlow and, and, and uh, Waterford. He had two brothers who were also priests and three sisters who were nuns. Uh, he studied at Carlow, was ordained in 1878, and came to Dubuque, where he was at the cathedral parish, St. Raphael's, and then, as he mentioned, at Rox Oxford. But he was also at three other parishes out there, Wyndham, Holbrook, and Parnell, all of them rural parishes west of Iowa City. He was said by the folks out there to be a good judge of horse flesh, and apparently when he had a distance to travel, local farmers would lend him their best team to pull the wagon so he could get where he needed to go. He was also described as being energetic, large-hearted, with a great executive organizing ability, which may be why Bishop Roman in, uh, 17, in 1889 appointed him the pastor of what was then St. Marguerite's Cathedral, now Sacred Heart Cathedral, because they were at the beginning of a building project and they didn't have any money. And so he came and, and raised the funds and built what is now Sacred Heart Cathedral. He continued on in 1895, Bishop Cosgrove made him his vicar general. Even before he was at the cathedral, Bishop David, Father Davis then was working for St. Ambrose. In 1887, there was an enormous debt at St. Ambrose, then only five years old, the debt was $20,000, big money in those days. So Bishop Cosgrove asked Father Davis and Father Schulte, who was the president of St. Ambrose, to tour the diocese raising money for the, to, to retire the debt. He frequently came over for student events. There's a record that on St. Patrick's Day celebration of 1892, he told the students, everybody should celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Not only the Irish, but everyone that's ever met an Irishman. Unfortunately, some carry it too far. Although the habit does not make the monk, neither does the green make the Irish. But it shows there is a liberal and generous heart beneath, and he urged his students to love their country, but not forget Ireland, the land of their forefathers. By 1903, Bishop Cosgrove's health was failing. He had cancer, and so he asked Rome to appoint a coadjutor bishop. That's a technical term, meaning he would succeed Cosgrove upon Cosgrove's death. Apparently there's a great deal of pressure to get Davis be the one name. We had a number of priests then who were fellow graduates from Carlo College, and they began to uh, organize things. Two of them, and Senior James Ryan, who was born in Kilbarren on River Shannon in, in Tipperary, and was the pastor of St. Mary's downtown here. Father Francis Ward from Columkill in Longford was at St. Patrick's in Iowa City. They wanted a Carlo man as the next bishop. Another Carlo man, however, Father James Foley, who was then at Sacred Heart in Otomo, didn't want Davis, and the speculation is that they had some sort of spat back in their seminary days, and Foley had never gotten over it. But Davis had more powerful allies. Uh, Archbishop John Ireland of St. Paul, Minnesota, who was an enormous figure in the late 19th century, and uh, who had been born in Kilkenny. Uh, Archbishop John Joseph Kane of Dubuque from Donegal, they were not Carlo men, but they were Irish immigrants and they wanted an Irishman, and specifically Davis. Father uh, Archbishop Patrick Ryan of Philadelphia from Tipperary wanted Davis, but most importantly, Cosgrove wanted Davis, Bishop Cosgrove, and, and he was appointed. Cosgrove said of Davis, his sound judgment has triumphed. His executive ability is a distinguishing mark in the government of his congregation. In his work as vicar general, I know he would be an ornament to the hierarchy of the church. The most energetic uh, thing said in Davis's favor came from an Irish priest across the river, Father Thomas Mackin in Rock Island, who said, like the people of Milan who cried out, Ambrose for bishop, so we in the fullness of heart exclaim, Davis for bishop. He was appointed and on November 30th of 1904 was consecrated a bishop at the cathedral. His first event was a week later at the Feast of St. Ambrose here on campus. And he came up to celebrate with the students. 
James O'Neill, a student in Council Bluff, said that the students hoped that Davis's visits to campus would become even more frequent. He called him a champion of education who would always have at heart the interests of St. Andrews. O'Neill said Davis was a man of his time, and as Schiller says, the man of his own time is the man of all times. Bishop Cosgrove died in December of 1906, and Davis immediately became the Bishop of Davenport. He did three things that I think are important for the, the story of the diocese and St. Ambrose. One of the very first things he did was not move into the bishop's house. At that point, Bishop McMullen and Bishop Cosgrove had lived in the Antoine Leclerc house, which is about three or four blocks east of the cathedral, and it was in pretty bad shape. So instead, Davis bought the Frank Miller house on the corner of 16th and Brady, Kirkwood and Brady, uh, which is where our advancement office currently lives. He bought it for $26,500 and moved in. Another thing he did for the diocese, and I know Bishop Amos will appreciate this greatly, the custom was that bishops of dioceses were what was called corporation soul. They owned everything. They owned every church, every piece of property, every building in their own name. Davis said within weeks, we're going to stop that. And he ordered that every parish and institution incorporate separately. Every parish was to send a financial report to him every year, audited by two laymen in the parish. And he formed a building committee for every deanery to oversee all the building that was going on. As Father Kahn said, the, the, the bishop discussed St. Ambrose at most of the meetings of his council. 1907, for example, they wanted to build an addition to Ambrose Hall. And uh, so Davis wrote to the people of the diocese appealing for funds. He calls St. Ambrose the crowning feature of the diocese and educational system. And St. Ambrose was the people's college and asked for their support. In 1919, as things were changing here in, in important ways that you can read about in my book, Davis initiated an endowment fund, raising $600,000 for the first endowment of, uh, for St. Ambrose. Again, by going around the diocese and raising money. And he supported proposals from the faculty to push for accreditation by North Central, which was an important issue for them. He didn't take an active role in that. But one thing he did, I think, was very important. He allowed his priests, who wanted to, to go away to study to get doctorates so they could come back with PhDs and teach at St. Ambrose. And he started what continued through the decades of priests from the diocese going away from degrees. In his time, the plans for this building were, were undertaken. The first half from this point south was built in 1922 for $109,000. And then the second half from there on north was built in 1927, after, shortly after Davis uh, had died, for $100,000. So you're living in an expensive building, folks. Couldn't do it for nearly that today, could we? The architect's fees wouldn't be that today. His health failed through 1925 and 26, and he died in December of 1926, only 74 years old. He was proud of St. Ambrose, he supported St. Ambrose, perhaps not as actively as Cosgrove had or his successor Bishop Rollman did, but Davis let things happen here and he understood the importance of St. Ambrose as the crowning feature of education in the diocese at Davenport. I was uh, proud to live in here for a semester and uh, I'm happy we're taking care of it uh, and uh, that we now have this uh, black to uh, indicate his importance, and I think we ought to send pictures to his family in, uh, in Ireland so they see all of this as well. So thank you very much.